All right? Now, let's jump into the last book of Acts. I mean, we've been all over the book of Acts. We started with coming in, that, uh, 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 that Pentecost happened, and the Holy Spirit came, and we looked at Peter's life, and through the book of Acts, we talked about a lot of persecution. We talked about a lot of trials, a lot of terrible circumstances. That's kind of the launch of the church, and we've learned a lot about the local church throughout our time over all these 42 sermons I preached through the book of Acts, and here recently, we've been looking at Paul's life. Since really Acts chapter 9, we've been looking at Paul's life. And it's taken us all the way to the point that he ended in a shipwreck last week. And we get to the shipwreck, and we come to the end of the shipwreck tonight, or today. We're, it's not nighttime, I don't think. Um, but today in Acts chapter 28 is where we're going to pick up. And as we look at Acts chapter 28, and we read Acts chapter 28, verse 1, it says, Once safely on shore, we found out that the island was called Malta. Now you say, why would you stop at that point? What is the significance of all of this? I, you know, when I was reading it, I thought, once we're safely on shore. So the author of the book of Acts is a guy named Luke, right? And now Luke's saying, once we're safely on shore. They'd just gone through this whole shipwreck. They didn't know what was about to happen. And they landed on a safe spot. Remember, Paul said, stay on the boat. Don't get off the boat. Stay on the boat. Sometimes you got to go through the storm to experience a blessing, right? And he had to go through the storm. He said, stay on the boat. And then they land safely. And I love how Luke did not write, man, God, that was crazy. Lord, what in the heck are you doing? Like, like, it, you will not understand this one day when you're reading this thousands of years later. And, but I'm telling you, this was nuts. And, and Paul had always prayed to go to Rome. But God, really, we had, to, we had to go off this shore and we had to walk through all of this. And sometimes we focus in life more on the storm instead of the blessing of the storm. Luke's Paul's and he experienced the blessing of the storm. And he said, we're blessed because we're safe. Are you recognizing how God gets you safely through a storm? Or are you just so focused on the storm that you're missing out on the blessing? It's tough to do, isn't it? It's tough when you walk through a circumstance that challenges you. But Paul stopped, and Luke recognized uh, safely to the shore. Then they get to Malta. Malta, this magnificent, mega, 17-mile-long, 9-mile-wide, little insignificant island. Uh, you know what Paul never prayed? Lord, take me to Malta. He never prayed that. He never hit his knees and fasted and said, God, I want to see a mighty move. I want you to use me. Put me in chains. Send me on a shipwreck. God, I don't care what it takes, but take me to Malta. It, it's 17 miles long. It, it's nine miles wide. That's not a big deal, right? Like some of you ride bikes longer than that a day which I think is nuts, but whatever. And uh, I think it's awesome that you do it. Some of you run more than that a day. Like you could just run around Malta and call it a day. Wouldn't that be great? And just run around the island. That's where he landed is such an insignificant spot. Now, I began to think about this, this spot of insignificance, and I began to think, man, God, why Malta? Well, why would you land Paul, the greatest evangelist of all time, the most bold guy of all time? You put him in the most insignificant spot, and you place him in this insignificant little place called Malta, but Maybe our place of insignificance is God's place of significance. Maybe you enter into a place that is not so significant in your mind. Maybe you go through the journey of 2020, right? And you lose a job, and the, then the job you get is a lot less than the job you have. And you're sitting there mourning by the fact that you're at a less of significant spot. Think about that. Maybe your place of insignificance is God's place of significance. Maybe God has you right where he wants you today. Maybe the shipwreck is right what he wanted you to go through. Maybe it took a shipwreck. Maybe it took a storm to get you to your place of insignificance because it was God's place of significance so he could use you like he's never used you before. Maybe God wants to do something extraordinary in your life. Do you believe that? Like, do you believe you woke up this morning on purpose? 
You're here on purpose today. If you're watching online, some of you are still laying in bed. You're like, I'm not up yet, Pastor. Well, get up. Amen. Goodness sake, it's 930. Stop sleeping in. And, but you know, we got to get up, right? And, and maybe you got up today, but you got up on purpose. God woke you up today on purpose. God brought you to church or put you online on purpose. God gave you the job he gave you on purpose purpose. you got a purpose today, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is your purpose. And you know what? Paul might have never prayed to go to Malta, but he was going to be used in Malta because that's where God had him. Well, I could preach that, couldn't I? Watch. Verse 2. Whew. Well, we might, y'all might ought to chain me up today because I'm, I might need a I might need to lock myself down. I might take off running here in a minute. Some of you are like, I thought this was a Baptist church. It is. Stop stressing if you're visiting. Go to Grow Track and you'll know, okay? Let's keep going. The Islanders show. Some of you are like, what's that mean? You just didn't grow up in church, so you don't get the theology of it, but that's okay. The Islanders showed us, watch this, unusual kindness. They showed us unusual kindness. Paul wasn't used to this kind of kindness. Paul was used to being having rocks thrown at him. Paul was used to the religious leaders beating him up. But see, they weren't there on Malta. So what they do, they built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. And so if it's going to be raining and cold, we need to build a fire. So Paul's like, man, I want to help you guys because Paul was a servant. So I want to help you guys build a fire. So Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper or a snake was driven out by the heat, and it fastened itself onto Paul's hand. Now, what an unfortunate place of an event. I mean, you've, been, you've had rocks thrown at you. You've been drug out of a city and rocks thrown at you to kill you. That didn't work. Then you get through several more persecuted moments. That didn't work. A group of Jews put together a pack to kill you on your way to Caesarea. That didn't work. So then you get put on a ship and a big storm comes and you have a shipwreck. That didn't work. And then all the guards getting off the boat said, we want to kill all the prisoners, and that didn't work. And now you get off in Malta safely, and you go to help somebody do something, and a snake jumps out and bites you. I hate snakes. Anybody with me? Who are snake? Let's just put your hands down if you hate snakes. Who loves snakes? Yeah, I'm just looking at who I never need to hang out with. In our church, it's not that I don't love you. I'm just not going to hang out with you, okay? You're loved by your pastor. You just, I'm not going to, we're not, we're not chilling together, okay? And uh, because you're going to be like, oh, a snake, let me pick it up. Woo, look at this and bring it to me. And I might punch you in the face. And I I don't mean to, it's just flesh, right? I I mean, I just, I just hate snakes. If I would have saw this moment, I would have taken off running and said, Paul, you're on your own on this one, buddy. If I'm Luke, I'm out of here, right? I'm like, I'm not writing this down because I'm gone. And, but this snake jumps out, fastened itself. I mean, could you imagine what Paul's thinking? Are you kidding me? But the enemy had tried tacking him so many different ways. So the, maybe the only option left to get to Paul was on the inside. Maybe he needed to put some venom in him from a snake and attack him on the inside instead of on the outside. And is that not how the enemy works sometimes? Man, we make it through and we're like, made it through that storm. Made it through that storm. Man, that was a tough part of my life right there. Made it. And then depression sets in. Then anxiety sets in. And then stress sets in. And then anger sets in. And then prejudice sets in. And then all this on the inside sets in. And it begins to attack you on the inside. Well, once again, what happens when Paul's attacked on the inside? When the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, This man must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, we recognize that, the goddess justice has now allowed him 
to live. But Paul, watch this. What did he do? He went Taylor Swift on him one more time. Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. So what did Paul do? He got attacked that the enemy of a snake, which we learned in Genesis 1 is the devil, by the way. Anyways, and so you got the snake that comes and attacks him or in Genesis 3. And, and we learn that. And, and the snake comes and attacks him. And in the midst of that attack, what's Paul do? He shakes it off. He shakes it off. Once again, third time in the book of Acts, it uses the word, the phrase, shake it off. Right? I told you Taylor Swift was not the first. Remember that? I told you that way back when I sang that song, and I'm sure Griders kept the sound bite of that, so I'm not going to do it again. But what do we got to do when it comes to our life? Maybe the storms led you to depression. What do you need to pause in your life and shake off? Maybe you got some inner anger. It's just got you. What do you need to shake off? Maybe you got some inner stress right now. And you need to shake it off. And the only way that Paul's able to shake it all off is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And maybe through the power of the Holy Spirit, you need to be set free today. Maybe through the power of the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit to breathe life into you, speak life into you. Maybe you're watching online and you just need the Spirit of God to breathe life into you. And as he breathes life into you today, you can stand up and say, I've been attacked. I've been hit. I've been faced with it. It hurts on the inside, but I can shake it off because greater is he that is in me than he that is in this world. My God lives inside of me through the power of the Holy Spirit, so I can stand to shake it off. Who needs to shake off the vipers in their life today? we got to shake it off. That's what Paul did. Watch what happened as a result. Good thing he stopped in Malta because of this. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall dead. Wouldn't that be a sight? But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual happen to him, They changed their minds and said he was a god. There was an estate nearby that that belonged to the chief official of the island. And what did he do? He welcomed us. Once again, we see that they treated him with unusual kindness in verse 2. And now he, he welcomed us in his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. I could pause right here and talk about the local church and talk about how we need to be a house that welcomes people, how we need to be a house that says we need to treat people with over and abundance kindness. I pray when people come to our church that they say that was the most welcoming church, that was the friendliest church, and if you don't want to be that church, there's a lot of great churches in this city for you, just not this one. Amen, somebody? Why? Because we love people. Well, I I need to move off that because I'm going to preach about kindness, and that's not even part of my sermon. I'm telling you, that's who we need to be. That's who your neighbors need to see you as who you are. Who's that family? Who lives there when the realtor's driving through the neighborhood? <laughs> the nicest people in the neighborhood. Try and be HOA president and get that said about you. Amen. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever. Paul went to see him and after prayer placed his hand on him and healed him. When this happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. And people kept coming to Paul and people kept getting healed on Malta. What happened at Malta was a mighty move of God happened in Malta because a storm led Paul to the most insignificant place. We see a significant thing happen and it's like Nineveh. When Jonah went to Nineveh, it took a big fish to get him there, but he finally gets there. When he gets to Nineveh, we see a whole community repent and give their lives to Jesus. Paul's, what's he doing as he's healing people? He's telling people about Jesus. Sometimes your place of insignificance is going to be God's place of significance, and he's going to use you if you'll receive it right where you are, and you're going to see a move of God happen. So recognize where you're at today and trust that that's where God has you. Then Paul arrives in Rome. Verses 11 through 14, we kind of see the journey to get there. And then it says, and so we came to Rome, where he always longed to go, where he always wanted to be. The brothers and sisters here had heard that we were coming. They traveled as far as Forma and Apius and the three taverns to meet us. They'd come a long way. At the sight of these people, Paul thanked God and was encouraged. But can I just tell you this? It says he thanked God and was encouraged. Now, 
Why? Because the people of God encourage each other. You need to recognize people in your life. This is why a small group is valuable in your life. This is why we do small groups all over our city all during the week. Why? To connect you in a place so you can be encouraged during the week because life's not always encouraging. You know how Paul came off the boat? He came off the boat in these. You ever seen these on? Let me just show them to you real quick. I know, Jack, I had this down to do in my sermon a little bit later, but I'm going to go ahead and I think I might preach the rest of the time in these. Did I put the key up? Do you got the key? Okay, we'll just pray the key shows up. Anybody a cop in the room that has a pair of keys on him? This is comforting. Sorry, I'm just making sure the key's up. I actually turned the, this one, the key's upside down, so somebody's got to climb underneath my feet in a minute. Jack? Paul comes off the boat. I'm in Rome. I'm in Rome. Can you imagine him coming off the boat? I, just looking up. Just, just looking around. I, I'm in Rome. I'm here. I'm fulfilling God's purpose. You know what? Paul's not doing this a preach. That hurts bad. You know what he's not doing? Man, I made it to Rome. And I appreciate y'all coming to see me, but I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm in chains. Paul never focused on his chains. He focused on his message. And sometimes our chains get us off our message. And sometimes our chains and our storms hold us back. But I want to tell you, what did he do? He said, thank God. And I was encouraged. I'm in chains, but I'm going to stand up. I'm going to be grateful for uh, six hours a day. Listen to this. Six hours a day, he was chained to a guard. And then at the rotation, every six hours, they would rotate. And as they rotated, a new guard would come. And he stayed in these chains, and he was also connected to somebody else, handcuffed together. Paul wasn't going anywhere. Paul wasn't getting messed around with. They were treating him like the ultimate criminal, yet he didn't look down and say, look at my chains. He never said that. Watch this. Three days later, he called together the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, My brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. That's why I'm in chains. If you just tuned in online and if you think I got arrested this week, I didn't. All right? Don't let that rumor get out there. He was in chains. He was in chains. I... I I, I was arrested in Jerusalem. This happened to me way back then. They examined me and wanted me to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. Five different trials they tried me. Remember, we studied all those trials. Five trials that they did this to me. For this reason, I've asked to see you and talk with you. I've asked for all of you to come to my house because he's under house arrest. Remember, he's under house arrest. So he can speak. He's chained to a guard under house arrest. He can speak to people, but they got to come to us. How would you like to be the guard chained to Paul the whole time? Bro, are you going to preach like this the whole time I'm next to you for six hours? Yeah, I am. You're going to get saved. No, I'm not. But you just, you're not going nowhere, so you're going to eventually, whether you like it or not. You're going to hear the gospel so much, the Holy Spirit is more powerful than your little attitude. Come on, somebody. And what's he say? He, he looks at these people, and, and he says, I, I've got to do something. The Jews objected, so I was compelled to make an appeal to Caesar. I came here because I chose to come here. Verse 20, for this reason, I've asked to see you and talk with you. It is, watch this, it's so good. It is because of the hope of Israel. For 35 years, y'all been praying for this guy named Jesus to come. For 35 years, y'all been asking for Jesus to come. It is because of the hope of Israel that I'm bound in these chains. Look at them. We're on the front porch right now. You ever have front porch talk? We're just on the front porch. Paul might be setting. If his chains hurt as bad as these, I, probably, I bet he is. He might be setting. He might be standing. He's definitely not doing much more than that. 
because of these chains. Because of these right here. Because of these chains. I'm bound with these chains. Why? Because of the hope of Israel. His name's Jesus. The prophets have told you he's coming. He's a great Messiah. And he came to free you of your chains. He came to rescue you of your chains. He came to set you free. Jack, before I go any further, would you mind letting me out? You mind? Y'all mind if I get out of these chains? These things are super uncomfortable. I haven't been in them 15 minutes. See a little hole right there? Y'all give Jack a hand. He helps us with our service every single week almost. Oh, there you go. I'll put that upside down too. There we go. Uh, this one. Oh, you need the key. Yeah, there we go. That one's right side up. Watch this. Y'all ready for this? This one's, this one's upside down. <laughs> Let's see. Oops. <laughs> Can I go higher? Uh, better not. My pants are a little tight. Um, <laughs> you liked that, didn't you, Scrivener? What's Paul say? I'm in these chains. How many times would we be more focused on the chains than the gospel message? I wonder if you were in the chains, would you be talking about the chains or would you be talking about the hope of Israel? Are you more focused about the circumstance in your life? Or are you more focused on that Jesus is the answer? That's why I love that song we just sang. Jesus, Jesus, he's a hope in the darkness. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the guidance. What's Paul saying? He's saying it's because of Jesus. He wrote the book of Ephesians. Why he was in chains, by the way. He sat next to the guard during the day for six hours. He's preaching the gospel. And then during the night, he's writing the gospel. And could, I'm telling you, every guard had to come to know Christ. He wrote Ephesians 6, and he put this in 6, 19 through 20. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words be, may be given to me. He's writing this to the Ephesian, to the Ephesus, to the church of Ephesus. Words may be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. I am in chains, but I'm here to make much of Jesus, not my chains. I'm here to declare that Jesus is king, not my chains. I'm a free man in chains. Come on, somebody. Who's a free man in chains? You might be in chains, but you can declare through the power of Jesus Christ, I've been set free, and the world can't hold me. The culture can't hold me. Nothing can stop me because the gospel is in me. That's the Apostle Paul. I might have chains, but I'm telling you, pray that I may declare fearlessly as I should. Verse 21, they replied, We've not received any letters from Judea concerning you. And they began to talk about how none of this, we haven't, we, we've, we've heard of this, but we haven't talked about this. In verse 23, they arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and came in ever large numbers to the place where he was staying. In large numbers, they would just come and come and come. And then at night, he wrote Ephesians while he was in jail. He wrote Philippians. He wrote Colossians. He wrote Philemon. He wrote all of those in these chains. Anybody want to put these on after service and try and write a book? He never focused on the chains. But we focus too much on the change. chains. What did he say? He witnessed to them from morning till evening, it says. He witnessed to them. So what? He shared the gospel, the good news of Jesus, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses. Remember, he's telling them, remember the hope of Israel from the law of Moses. And y'all have been following these 600 prophetic laws your whole life. And this, the, all these, the Mosaic law and the Levitical law. And you've been following this your whole life. Uh, you've been studying that. And from the prophets, remember what the prophets talk about. And it says, he tried to persuade them. If you come to our church and you say, is our pastor trying to persuade us to come to know Jesus? Yes. Yeah. Because I know the destiny you're heading for. If you're watching online and you're like, well, are you trying to persuade me to give my life to Jesus? Yes. Unashamedly. I care where you're going to spend eternity. And if that offends you, I'm sorry. But I'm not going to let up on the gospel because it offends you because I know what it costs you. I care too much, and so should you. 
said he persuaded them about Jesus. Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. Listen, Paul's prison became the base of which he took the gospel to the world. He's just sitting in prison, y'all, and taking the gospel to the world. His circumstance was terrible, and some said yes, some said no, some argued, some disagreed. There was all of that, so be encouraged. You say, well, I've been inviting my one to church, and they'll never come to church. Well, Paul's didn't always either. Well, I've shared the gospel with somebody a hundred times, and they keep telling me no. That's okay. Share it a hundred and one. That's what Paul did. And they still, well, I share with one person. All they want to do is argue with me. That's okay. Paul had that problem too. Doesn't it feel good that Paul walked through what we walked through? But he never stopped. They disagreed among themselves. That sounds like a bunch of religious people, doesn't it? (laughs) They disagreed among themselves. We don't have that problem in America today. Anyways, they disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made this final statement, a statement that he quoted from the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said, through Isaiah the prophet, go to these people and say, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You'll be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear what with their ears, and they've closed their eyes. Sounds like a bunch of teenagers, does it not? Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them if they would. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. What's he trying to say? Healing begins with turning. Healing begins with turning. It always happens when you turn. If you want to be saved, you have to turn from your sin. If you want to experience life, you have to turn from death. If you want to experience heaven, you have to turn to Jesus, right? He's saying all of this, and, but what's he saying? He's saying your hearts are hard, and, you, and you're not open to the gospel. I wonder who's out here today in the room or watching online. And you just harden your heart. Something in life has happened, and it's got you. There's somebody watching online today, and there's probably somebody in the room in one of our services today that's mad at the church, and they're mad at God, and their hearts are hardened. Maybe the Lord wants you to hear, be open to what God has for you today. Don't let a circumstance you walk through, don't let a storm you walk through, don't let chains that have come upon you in your life become your life. Don't let the chains become your life. Let Jesus be the Lord of your life and not the chains. Paul never focused on it. He was open. Your ears are stopped up and you refuse refuse to hear the truth. You're just done. Yeah, matter of fact, when the conviction of God sets in, there's people that watch every week, and they stop watching as soon as conviction hits them. There's people in the room, as soon as conviction hits you, you get on your phone or you check out. Why? Because you don't want to hear the truth. You don't want to hear that God's calling you up a notch. And sometimes God calls us up a notch. Amen? And what's he saying? What's the apostle Paul saying? You need to go up a notch. Maybe it's in your behavior. Maybe it's in your attitude. Maybe it's in how much you drink. Maybe it's in the pornography you look like, but it's time to go up a notch. It's time to turn from sin and turn to Jesus, and it's time to change our life. It's time to look different so the world can see you look different so that many people can come to know Christ, and it's time you to stop closing your ears and open your heart to what God has for you. That's truth. That's what the Apostle Paul's trying. This is front porch talk, y'all. Paul's saying all this on the front porch. Any of you ever had this conversation on your front porch? Sitting in the barn swing, just swinging back and forth in shackles. Anybody want to borrow these today and just sit on your front porch and swing, see what happens? I might do that. Y'all drive by my house. He says, if y'all would change, I would heal you. Can I give you this truth today? God wants to free you from your chains. He might not take you out of your chains, but he wants to free you from your chains. Paul didn't get out of his chains, but we was freed of his chains. Let's keep going. You'll see some of your Bibles will have 
verse 29 there. Some of your Bibles will not have verse 29, and there's a long explanation of that. In short, historically, as new evidence has been brought out and new scripts have been found from the very time when the first ever Bible was put in English, y'all remember it, the King James Version. You know, there's people out there, if you don't read the King James, you're going to hell. I don't think that's in the Bible. But that you, you see that take place, and it was written in the early 1500s, and, and then the, the Bible started being translated a little bit different uh, uh, along the years, all lining up with the historical text. And if you go study things like called the Dead Sea Scrolls and all these ancient scripts, they all line up 100%. And there's a couple verses throughout the Bible you'll see descriptions like verse 29 or this particular verse in the Bible. And the early versions of the script, some of them didn't have it until the later, until they found some later. This was found in the 4th century is when they started adding verse 29 to this. Verse 29 would say, After he said these things, the Jews departed, so they left his house, which would have happened. We know that historically, that they weren't going to spend the night there, and we know Paul wrote there, so they would have departed while engaging in vigorous debate among themselves. We know that would have happened. Because everywhere he went and every religious conversation he had, people started debating. Because they looked at it as critics and not learners. Can I just, can I just give you this piece real quick? And, and I'll move on. Uh, and I, I'll wrap up in a minute, I promise. I know some of you are thinking, man, he's going to go forever today. Sometimes we need a forever sermon, amen? And uh, maybe you're here today because you needed a long one. <laughs> and, uh, and, but sometimes we'll come to church, and, and we really don't have this here. Uh, matter of fact, we don't have this at all since, since I've been around here. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, sometimes we'll come to church, and instead of looking for a lesson to learn from the Holy Spirit, we'll look for a lesson to fight about. And sometimes religious people are the worst. Or you'll get on social media, and we'll trash other people because of our spiritual opinion and not the foundational word. And we end in this vigorous debates all the time. And we'll go out here and be little people and just full of nonsense and uh, that's what the religious people did and as a result they miss what God was saying can I just give this to you <laughs> uh, sometimes we need to shut our mouths y'all with me can I be this frank sometimes we need to shut our mouths And we need to listen to what God has for us. Our mouths keep running and our heart stays hidden. And we miss a movement of God. Aren't you glad Paul didn't just keep running his mouth? Aren't you glad Paul didn't just stay focused on his chains? (laughs) Sometimes we need to shut our mouths and be open to what the Lord has. For two years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. In the midst of that time, he penned this in Philippians. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually advanced the gospel. He wrote this later. Has has actually advanced the gospel. I want you to know those chains advanced the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard. So the ones guarding me, the ones have been changed to me, is everyone and everyone else that my imprisonment is because I am in Christ. Everybody knows that it's because of Jesus that these chains are on me. Most of the brothers have gained confidence in the Lord, have given their life to Christ from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the word fearlessly. Uh, My shackles were used to be share. I'm shackled to share is what he's saying. I'm shackled to share. I go through what I go through for the gospel. I'll walk through a storm for the gospel. I, I, everything I face in my life is for the gospel. And it's all for Jesus. And he said, I'm shackled to share. And I'm going to let my chains speak. Why? Because I might be chained. But you know what's not chained is the word of God. Come on, somebody. 2 Timothy 2, 9. For which I'm suffered even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. I want to tell you, the enemy can't control the word of God. There's no power greater than the word of God. It is the word of God and it breathes into your life. Let it breathe into you today. Open your heart. 
Stop looking at the chains. That's where Paul took Paul towards the end of his life. We get to the very last verse penned in the book of Acts. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. He never stopped. They believe he then left for a four-year journey, and he went back on a missionary journey, made several different stops on that missionary journey, then ended back up in Rome on trial, and he was beheaded by Nero. You say, well, why doesn't the book, why does the book of Acts just stop like this? I think this, um, because the Word of God went without hindrance, and it ends with Paul taking the gospel, and then Paul dies, but the gospel didn't stop with Paul. It continued with me and you. The gospel continues, and the story continues. See, the book of Acts is not done yet. It's still being lived out today in me and in you. See, we're still living out. We're still writing the story, the story of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You say, but we got all kinds of hindrances today, right? We, prayer can't be in school anymore. Well, we can't do this. We can't do that. We got states telling you when you can go to church, when you can't go to church, how many can go to church, how many can't go to church. You get ridiculed if you stand up for the gospel of Jesus Christ today. I mean, we could talk about all the hindrances that are coming upon us today. But I want to tell you, the chains can't hold the word of God. It is firmer than any chain, and it stands bolder than any circumstance. And you can't hold back the word of God because the word of God is full of the Holy Spirit of God. And that Holy Spirit, if you have a relationship with Jesus, lives within you. I'm telling you, we can gain a lot from the book of Acts. And it can encourage us. It can challenge us. It can push us. But most of all, the number one message through the book of Acts is Jesus. That's it. Why? Because Jesus changes everything. And the question is, have you ever surrendered your life over to Jesus? Have you asked Jesus to step out of heaven and step into your life for an eternity? Have you ever entered into a personal relationship? I'm not talking about coming to church and reading your Bible. If you're watching online, I'm not talking about watching online every week. I'm talking about have you ever come to the point on your own, not from a pastor, not from a priest, not from anyone, on your own when you said it's time for me to give my life to Jesus? That's the message of the book of Acts. That's why Paul did what he did. And if you've never done that, could I lead you in a prayer today to surrender your life over to Jesus? If you're in the room or if you're watching online. Matter of fact, let's just bow our head and pray. You say, well, Pastor, I've never, I've never prayed like this. I had the opportunity to win somebody to the Lord this week. And they say, I've never prayed out loud. And I said, just give it your best shot. Maybe you're watching online or you're in the room. Right now, just give it your best shot. Say, dear Jesus, in the best way I know how, I turn my back on my sin and I give my life to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross. Thank you, Jesus, for setting me free. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. I promise to never, ever, ever be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. If you just prayed that prayer and you meant it with all your heart, and in this moment you're surrendering your lives to Jesus, I I want you to pull out your phone and I want you to text in the number that's on the screen right now. Whether you're online or you're in the room, just look up and pull out your phone and text in the word saved. Gave my life to Jesus today. It's a big moment in my life. I'm done running. I'm done trying to do it my own way. I'm done covering my ears. I'm done rebelling against the Lord. It's time I surrender my life to the Lord. Today's my day. Just text in that number right now. Text in saved. And can I ask everybody else in the room a question? What are your chains? What are you focused on that's holding you back? What are your shackles? What are the shackles in your life? Have they gotten on the inside of you? Are they holding you back on the inside? Do you need a pause in life and say, God, I need to shake some things off. 
Maybe today you need to shake the shackles off. It doesn't mean they fall off your arms or your feet. It just means emotionally you're beginning to say, I'm really beginning to trust in the Lord. And, and, and I'm going to trust in the ways of the Lord. I'm not going to trust in my ways. I'm going to trust in God's ways. And I'm going to rest on His ways for my life. And maybe today you got some things that are holding you back. Maybe they're there to propel you forward. <laughs> It's just a matter of you receiving where the Lord has you. Maybe you just need to pause and say, God, thanks for where you got me. It hurts. I don't love it, but I'm thankful for it. Would you use it to take the gospel to the world? Today, if you need to come to this altar and pray, if you need to pray with one of our pastors, we can have that moment and give it to you. Jesus, this is your moment. We trust it in your hands. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. Cody.